Welcome, good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Zanaida Gould and I am Executive Director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Julie Paisior to learn about the history and legacy of Mexican American organized mutual aid societies. Dr. Paisior is Professor Emeritus of History at Manhattan College and she's the author of a number of books and articles, including Democratic Renewal and the Mutual Aid Legacy of Mexican Americans, which was published by Texas A&M University Press in 2014. Another book of hers is LBJ and Mexican Americans, The Paradox of Power, which was published by the University of Texas Press. And one of her earlier works is Chicanos in South Bend, some historical narratives, um, which was published out, out of Notre Dame. And um, I do, uh, of course, want to welcome Dr. Paisio, but first I do want to thank our special sponsor for tonight, AARP San Antonio. Thank you so much for all you do for Macri AARP. Now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Paisio and invite you to take it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Gould, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks also to the funders um, who've helped make Macri establish itself as one of the most important civil rights institutes in the country. Um, also, I have a fondness for the location that Macri is in physically, Our Lady of the Lake University, because when I was working on my dissertation, I stayed in a dorm there while I was researching Mutualista organizations on the west side of San Antonio. It was an easy walk there. And the biggest uh, Mutualista was still in existence when I was doing my dissertation. It had minute books going back to 1886. And those minute books are now housed safely at Our Lady of the Lake. So thank you for that. However, at first glance, nothing seems more passe than ethnic Mexican mutual aid organizing. I mean, think about it. When it was operating 100 years ago, it got no attention from the national press in the US. Um, and then most of these organizations had faded away by the 1940s. But as we shall see, the long tradition of barrio mutual aid continues to resonate in a number of significant ways. Let's start with civil rights, because this is, after all, the Mexican-American Civil Rights Institute. Next. In the 1870s, the ex escalation of attacks on Mexican Texans by the Texas Rangers and other law enforcement officials prompted the founding of many Sociedades Mutualistas. As historian Arnaldo de Leon has pointed out, there were a dozen in Laredo and 30 in Corpus Christi alone by the 1870s. Or take the case of Catarino Garza. He gained fame for his attacks on the forces of Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz, but actually Garza gained the admiration of Texas Mexicans with his speeches in defense of minority rights and his promotion of mutualista societies. Garza established a whole number of uh, Mexican mutual aid societies uh, in South Texas. They became a network. Um, and this was in the 1880s, and his newspapers, including one called El Mutualista, denounced many of the actions against ethnic Mexicans on the part of the authorities. And things came to a head in 1888 after he accused customs agent Victor Sibri of the unprovoked killing of two Tejanos. It came to a head. He'd made lots of charges, but this came to a head because he ran into Seabree in Rio Grande City and Seabree promptly shot him. Enraged, about 200 Mexican Texans pursued Seabree. Next, please. 
and the governor of Texas. Uh, so Seabree, they pursued Seabree and he um, uh, sought refuge in a military base. Meanwhile, the governor of Texas sent the entire force of the Texas Rangers, plus 250 sheriffs, plus elements of the 3rd Cavalry to Rio Grande City. But um, Garza's followers had, of course, scattered by then. Um, here we have a, an image of the cavalry talking to a resident um, trying to find Garza uh, in the wake of that incident. And you'll notice that this image is by Frederick Rem Remington, Frederick Remington, the most famous artist of the uh, U.S. West. And um, Seabree remained a customs official, but in a sense, Garza got the last word. 10 years later, in 1899, he published the book, La Logica de los Hechos, o sea, Observaciones sobre las Circunstancias de los Mexicanos en Texas desde el año 1877 hasta 1899. That's the title. <laughs> um, this book is a manifesto documenting the attacks on Mexican Texans over more than two decades. Meanwhile, somebody else from South Texas, in a 2010 speech to a federal civil rights agency, civil rights leader Raul Izaguirre put it this way. He was explaining to the agency this history and he said, there have been a lot of killings in our community that have been largely untold. And he added that Mutualista networks, quote, formed the framework for a lot of civil rights activity, end quote. Izaguirre also told me that although his family claimed a Texas land grant dating from 1721, his grandmother told him of unprovoked attacks on them and on other Texas Mexican families by the Rangers. And of course, now we have that important group called Refusing to Forget, who's answering um, Izaguirre's call. And they were showcased, of course, recently. They were showcased last year, of course, in a Macri panel, great panel. Izaguirre recalled how in his hometown of San Juan, Texas, people met at the Mutualista Hall to challenge the local political boss, Tom Mayfield, and that this prompted Mayfield to send his goons in to break it up, as Isaguirre explained it. He also told me that he received a scholarship from the local Mutualista group, and that made a lot of difference in him being able to go on to college, and that the example of those local activists also helped set his path as a civil rights um, activist. Um, he was he would go on to be one of the founders and the longtime leader of National Council of La Raza, uh, now known as Unidos U.S. And in a sense, Unidos U.S. is the most prominent civil rights organization in the United States. If you consider the fact that it is the most prominent civil rights organization for Latinas Latinos and that Latinx people are the largest minority group in the country. Um, at the same time, my book also does look at the fact that Unidos US and other and the other main national civil rights organization, the NAACP with African Americans that Unidos US and NAACP actually don't have a huge membership base. They actually get more of their money from corporate sponsors than from dues paying members. And, you know, I try to tease out, does that matter or not? And so forth in the book. At any rate, 
Concern over these attacks led ethnic Mexican mutual aid and fraternal organizations to get together at a Congress in 1911, the Primer Congreso Mexicanista. It took place in Laredo because, as many historians have noted, this call was first put out by the Laredo newspaper La Cronica, which was published by the famous activist Idar family. Next slide, please. Yes, here is journalist, educator, activist Jovita Idar. Next slide. And if we could put the cursor over the man in the front row with a mustache, um, yeah, him. That is Clemente Idar, one of Jovita Idar's brothers, also a journalist and also a labor organizer. At any rate, the Idars spread the word about the, the Congreso. After the Congreso, Mutualista members who had been there went home and um, expanded their legal aid and protection activities. Also, some people who had been there went home and founded new mutual aid groups that took for their name Protectora, La, Agru La Agrupación Protectora Mexicana. There were several of those founded in right after the Congreso. Also, the Liga Protectora Latina, based in Arizona, established a number of chapters in Texas at this time. Also, San Antonio attorney M.C. Gonzalez founded La Liga Protectora Mexicana, which defended workers and small landowners. Next slide, please. Mutualista groups also fought discrimination in the new motion picture industry. In 1917, for the first time, a Hollywood production team came to Texas to do some filming. And um, Mutualista groups protested, charging that the movie, The Heart of the Sunset, was racist. Heart of the Sunset portrayed a white damsel, the beautiful Allaire, attacked by a Mexican bandit. And with Allaire rescued by who else? A Texas Ranger. He was supported by the U.S. Army Cavalry in this story. In real life, the U.S. Cavalry, well, remember them chasing Garza, right, in 1888? Well, now in 1917, they had just returned from Mexico after having invaded on a fruitless expedition to try and capture Pancho Villa. With this major revolutionary figure typically characterized in the U.S. press as a bandit. The Mutualista groups took their complaints about Heart of the Sunset all the way to the Mexican ambassador in Washington. Still, the future of civil rights organizing would be the future of civil rights organizing would be with the organizations founded largely by Mexican-American veterans of World War I, some of them attorneys, culminating with the establishment in 1929 of the League of United Latin American Citizens. LULAC would lobby Congress directly, not through the Mexican ambassador, the Mutualista movement faded from the scene, overshadowed by the rise of the LULAC generation. But even more, it was devastated by the economic and political effects of the Great Depression of the 1930s. The Depression was a double whammy. You know, during the Great Depression, so many people were out of work. And yes, the first people fired were often people of Mexican heritage. The second aspect was that during the depression, local authorities from the Southwest to the Midwest engaged in roundups 
of ethnic Mexican people and sent them to Mexico. All of this devastated the Mutualista groups. I don't mean to say, however, that um, the Mutualista and LULAC were totally opposite. M.C. Gonzalez, the fellow who, who founded that um, Agrupacion Protectora in San Antonio, uh, would go on to be a founder of LULAC, for example. And when LULAC began filing desegregation lawsuits, the members often did so in conjunction with Mutualista organizations notably the Alianza Hispano-Americana. Next slide, please. Ooh, yeah. And then the next slide. So th I'm sorry, th these are members and officers of the Alianza Hispano-Americana. Next slide. And these are also officers of the Alianza Hispano-Americana. Amer Americana. It had been founded in 1894 by Mexicans in that part of Arizona that had been annexed to the United States in 1853. And in the succeeding decades, there was more and more discrimination. The AHA established a legal defense fund in the 1920s and would go on to win a lawsuit in 1951 that would lead to the desegregation of several Arizona school districts. The Alianza had come a long way for at its founding in the 1890s, it had restricted membership to whites. This was in contrast to the vast majority of Mexican mutual aid organizations, which almost none of them um, issued racial policies of any kind. On the other hand, the Alianza was among the few traditional mutualista groups to officially declare women to be equal members. In San Antonio, the Alianza Hispano-Americana chapter even had a woman as its president at one point, Luisa M. Gonzalez, who was a midwife by profession. And being the head of the San Antonio chapter meant that she was the, in a sense, the AHA leader in the city that was the unofficial capital of US Mexicans, seeing as how San Antonio had the largest ethnic Mexican population in the country until late 1940s. So this is pretty amazing when you consider that women did not, were not presidents of organizations. I don't care if you say Anglo, Mexican, whatever. I don't care if you say business, labor, cultural, whatever. They weren't the heads. So, so all of um, th this is pretty amazing. Uh, in the other mutualist organizations, though, women were, did not have equal official roles. And again, this... Let's put it in context. The vast majority of organizations did not have women in equal roles until the 1970s at the earliest. <clears throat> to the extent that these organizations did have women officers, they were, they were actually ahead of LULAC as historian Cynthia Rosco, Cynthia Rosco, who was involved in a um, related um, mockery event, I think it was earlier this month. Anyway, as historian Cynthia Rosco wrote, with the advent of LULAC, quote, mutualism was redefined to mean leadership by the male Mexican-American middle class rather than cooperative effort by all members of La Raza. End quote. Also, women operated a number of their own mutualista groups, by and for women. Many of them were named Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez. They were named after Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez, La Corregidora of Mexican Independence fame. Next, please. There she is, La Corregidora. 
the president of Sociedad Mutualista Josef Ortiz de Dominguez of San Antonio gave a speech at the 26th anniversary celebration of a mutualist organization led by men. It was happened to be called Sociedad Mutualista Benito Juarez. Again, this is something that rarely happened at that time. That is a woman giving a formal speech to an audience that included men. <clears throat> also, a few Mexican mutual aid groups listed women in their title, the ones that had, you know, male and female members. Um, for example, the Sociedad Morelos de Obreros y Obreras in Corpus Christi. Next, please. If you have really good eyes at the top, you can see that it says up there, Obreros y Obreras. Um, next slide, please. They're the founders who were all men. Next. There's some of the obreras. Next. And there is the youth from Sociedad Obreros y Obreras. At any rate, women were active, even essential members of these organizations, particular, particularly when it came to fundraising. They were the ones that had the bazaars and all that sort of thing. It's crucial funds for the survival of these groups. Also, women were central to the founding of the Mutualista movement itself in the sense that these groups typically began with death and burial benefits and women were central to this sad but important activity. People were concerned that the beloved dead be treated with dignity. Um, actually, previous slide, please. Thank you. People were concerned that the beloved dead be treated with dignity and women traditionally were in charge of a crucial component, the formal viewing where loved ones and friends paid their respects. And after the funeral, the mourners would return to the house where women led the prayers and the morning rituals and organized the reception. Then for nine days, the older female parishioners, particularly respected for their piety, conducted a novena for the spiritual intention that the, souls of the, that the soul of the deceased might find peace in heaven. Women also typically were in charge of the grave, site, of the grave sites. Now, given the importance of a proper burial, a special meeting of the Mutual Aid Society was usually convened to plan the funeral when a member passed away. Next slide, please. And next. Here we have a page from 1917 from one of the minute books of Sociedad de la Unión that I mentioned at the outset. And they would talk about this, you know, in the minutes, you know, planning the... Uh, uh, funeral activities. Also, the, they would talk in the minutes about um, sending condolences to the family, as when a member of La Union thanked the society for its sympathy on the death of his mother, and he added proudly that she was a descendant of a general who had fought the French invaders in the Battle of Puebla, which of course we mark on Cinco de Mayo. For his part, San Antonio laborer Lucas Garza, who joined Sociedad de la Unión in 1924, told me that when his beloved brother died, la Unión gave him a solemn funeral that Garza would never forget, with the members solemnly processing in their mutualista uniforms. The importance of a proper burial ahead of even efforts to attend to, to, to other desperate needs like, you know, food and medical assistance. Um, this reminds us of the ways in which the past is, diff is, this reminds us of the ways in which the past is a different place. You know, we'd care more about food aid, I think. One thing we would relate to, though, I think, is the, the fact that with the burial 
benefits came death benefits for the family. That is a fund, a lump sum of money that the remaining family would receive. <clears throat> At any rate, burial insurance was famously central to the founding of European immigrant mutual benefit societies, Sons of Italy, Polish National Alliance, and so forth. So in many ways, they were so similar, right? On the other hand, um, where was I? <laughs> um, you'll recall that actually mutualista groups initially were founded for mutual protection by a people often considered racially inferior. As such, this organizing echoed African-American mutual benefit associations. Not as well known, even though the first one, the Free African Society, Mutual Aid Society, was founded in Philadelphia in 1787. Thus, mutualista organizations reflect the, the Mutualista movement reflects the two major themes in U.S. history, immigration history and the history of minority groups. These organizations grew exponentially with the mass immigration of Mexicans between 1890 and 1930. From San Diego, Texas, from San Diego, California, to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, in every barrio across the country, there were mutualista groups, folks banding together for survival. And once they were on their feet and had the burial benefits, most of them added um, medical insurance. Lucas Garza told me that his Sociedad de la Unión even managed to pay out death and illness benefits during the height of that other pandemic, the influenza uh, epidemic of 1918. And actually, during our own time of pandemic, the mutual aid ethos has once again come to the fore, particularly among communities of essential workers. The magazine The Progressive noted, quote, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, mutual aid networks in hundreds of U.S. cities have formed to help people who might otherwise fall through the cracks. Fall through the cracks. Yes, so many essential workers risk their lives to deliver us food, those of us who are sheltering in place, even as so many in undocumented status uh, were fearful of seeking any kind of aid, of support. So people turned to mutual aid. That article in the magazine entitled its, had the title, Friends in Need, Mutual Aid Societies Offer a Model of Cooperation for Helping the Vulnerable. It begins with the example of historic African-American mutual aid societies. And then the author quoted me on the continuing resonance of the mutualista model um, with many self-help mutual aid groups among today's Mexican migrant communities. So yes, at their peak, mutualista organizations added medical insurance benefits. Most also added some of the following. Food banks, legal aid, adult ed classes, support of bilingual bicultural private schools, and support of barrio-based health clinics. Also, they typically had their own headquarters and those were really important in the neighborhood. Yes, it's a place where you could have a you know inexpensive wedding reception, but more important as a safe place in an often hostile world to have meetings, to have organized rallies, organized strikes and so forth. 
The, mushroom, the mushrooming of mutualist associations led to the formation of leagues and federations. In San Antonio, nine, nine of them found, founded La Alianza de Sociedades Mutualistas in 1926. That same year in Los Angeles, La Confederación de Sociedades Mutualistas La Confederación de Sociedades Mexicanas banded together with the Liga Protectora Latina and the Mexican Consulate. Together, they successfully defeated an anti-immigration bill. It would have required the Los Angeles City Council to exclude from city projects any contractors that hired non-citizens any contractors that hired non-citizens. As such, this activism anticipated the networks, uh, the um, activism of Mexican migrant organizations today that work for immigration reform. Ethnic Mexican mutual aid organizing also affected the labor movement then and now. Indeed, Although Mutualista members included small business owners, you know, shopkeepers, funeral directors, and so forth. And a few, they also included a few professionals as their members, a doctor, a local pharmacist, or lawyer. Most members were from the working class. One of the longest serving and most prominent presidents of Sociedad de la Unión, again, Sociedad de la Unión was the largest Mutualista in San Antonio. And one of the most prominent presidents it ever had was Guadalupe Baez, who was by profession a cowboy. I think that's cute. And these minutes, okay, so and also with these minutes on the screen, you can see how carefully it's handwritten, you know, very nice handwriting. Um, nonetheless, these minutes, the minutes of the organizations had phonetic misspellings typical of people with only a rudimentary uh, formal education. Also, more than a few ethnic Mexican mutual aid societies had in their title the word obrero or jornalero or trabajador, you know, laborer, worker. <clears throat> as in the case of Sociedad Mutualista Morelos de Obreros y Obreras, right? The, the slides we saw earlier. Um, workers, I'm sorry, laborers, right? Um, back, please. Back, back, please. Back to the Idar sl slide, if you could. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Those of you historians doubtly, doubtless noticed that Clemente Idar, fellow in the mustache, dark mustache, is sitting next to a fellow with a white mustache and beard who you historians know is Samuel Gompers, the, long, the famous longtime serving and co-founder founder of the American Federation of Labor, the nation's largest labor organization a uh, hundred years ago, and it may be today. It's just a hugely important organization. Um, Clemente Idar was the first national AFL organizer to recruit members among ethnic Mexicans. And much of his recruiting was among mutual aid groups. Indeed, as Cynthia Orozco has noted, quote, organizing Mexican workers usually involved the recruitment of entire mutual aid societies. In the book, I trace Clemente Idar's tortured path as here he is this trailblazing organizer among ethnic Mexicans, and he's not appreciated in the AFL because the AFL too often, well, the AFL many of its leaders were pushing for immigration restriction. Um, forward to the SPM DTU slide, please. 
Thank you. One of the largest ethnic Mexican mutual aid associations had a strong labor identity, the SPM DTU, Sociedad Protección Mutua de Trabajadores Unidos, founded in Southern Colorado in 1900. Trabajadores Unidos, right? It grew to some 70 chapters in Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. SPMDTU provided not only death benefits and social activities, but also payments for workers wrongfully dismissed, and uh, it served as an employment information center. Next, please. In Arizona, meantime, residents of the mining region, quote, developed a labor organization within the womb of the mutualistas, as historian Linda Gordon put it. In 1903, they staged a walkout in Morency, Arizona, protesting a mine owner cutting hours and wages, and they demanded wage parity with Anglo and Irish miners. When management balked, some of the organizers staged a sit-in at the company's office. The governor of Arizona responded by sending in the Arizona Rangers, who were patterned on the Texas Rangers, and President Theodore Roosevelt even sent in federal troops. Here we have one of the leaders, Abran Salcido, who was convicted of supposedly rioting. There wasn't a riot. Salcido served his full two-year sentence in the scorching, rattlesnake-infested Yuma prison, along with a number of other Mexicanos affiliated with mutual aid groups, including one who died while imprisoned. After his release, Salcido teamed up with the founder of a Morenci Mutualista group by the name of Prasidis Guerrero. Salcido and Guerrero both were also members of the radical Partido Liberal Mexicano, and they went off in support of the radical mining strike in Cananea, Sonora in 1906, and they influenced upwards of 100 other Arizona Mexicans to join them across the border. This transborder action, these transborder actions, constituted, quote, a defining moment in the history of Mexicans, not just in Arizona, but in Mexico itself. Here I'm quoting Rodolfo Acuna, the trailblazing Chicano historian, who said that the Cananea strike, quote, was a precursor of the Mexican Revolution. Anyway, this transborder organizing of a century ago prefigured the what is today considered really cutting edge organizing, global labor organizing. I mean, corporations have been global for what, 50 years? Management's been global, workers have not been. And so there's there's been an initiative in the last dozen years to have workers organize transnationally. And here, this was happening over 100 years ago. And it serves as, as an example to some of the trailblazing organizers in this respect today. Take the case of Lucas Benitez of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Immokalee Workers, farm workers in Central Florida. The CIW gained fame for getting, for, for space, getting <laughs> not only U.S. corporate giants such as McDonald's and Taco Bell, but also international companies such as French giant Sodexo to all pay more for their tomatoes and to pass the price increase on to the farm workers as monitored by CIW instead of to the farmers. 
Uh, so Dexo, you may recall, runs food services in many U.S. colleges and universities. Benitez told me that he was encouraged in his efforts when he saw the historical example of transborder organizing in the, in the Arizona Sonora region by these minor activists of the early 1900s. Um, next, please. Whoop, I guess it didn't make it, shoot. Uh, I thought I had a picture. Okay, next, let's, uh, uh, if you could stop the sharing actually. Thank you. I thought I had a photo of Ralph Guzman. Oh, well. Um, you can look him up. He has a wiki page. Um, Ralph Guzman was a member of the Alianza Hispano-Americana in the 1940s and 50s. He was head of their civil rights division. He was a political scientist in um, California, and he was also a founder of a community organizing group, the Community Service Organization. And that is another way that the mutual aid, as with the example of Guzman, that's another way that the mutual aid organizations have left an important legacy, and that is their influence on community organizing. <clears throat> Community organizing, helping people. Oh, there he is. That's Ralph Gutzman. <laughs> Thank you. Community organizing, helping people identify their community's needs and developing the skills to influence those in power to respond to the problems. So people in the neighborhood would develop the, figure out what problems mattered to them and then have the skills to effectively petition business leaders and political leaders. Famously, this method was developed by Saul Alinsky of Chicago. Alinsky's lead organizer in California, Fred Ross Sr., trained Cesar Chavez and, yes, Ralph Guzman, among others. <laughs> For his part, the most famous community organizer, Ernesto Cortez Jr., grew up in San Antonio. True, he learned his skills in Chicago with Alinsky and with Alinsky's successor, Ed Chambers. But, but Cortez first gained national attention, Cortez first gained national attention from his pioneering work in his native San Antonio. As many of you know, in this old center of mutualista activity, Barrio residents founded COPS, Communities Organized for Public Service. COPS members mutually discern their policy needs and then mutually plan accountability sessions where these top business and political leaders come and respond to community grievances. Cortez puts it this way, quote, there is that ownership, collaborative agency, mutual agency, this sense of obligation. So there's a connection with the mutualista source. On the other hand, the strong Mexican identity of these old mutual aid groups could sometimes result in a kind of parochialism, lo mexicano, to the near exclusion of any other culture. This is an attitude rejected by community organizers. As Ernie Cortez told an interviewer, there is a plurality to ourselves that goes beyond being Mexican or gay or male or female or whatever it is. We are each of us multiple persons. And of course, the successes of community organizing groups from the Southwest to other parts of the country nationally, their major policy successes dwarf the 
the successes of the Mutualista groups of your. Nonetheless, contemporary community organizing was prefigured by, for example, the Liga Pro Defensa Escolar, the School Improvement League of the 1930s, driven to a large extent by mutual aid groups such as Sociedad de la Unión, the School Improvement League pressured the school district on the west side of San Antonio to improve facilities, add teachers, and build, add, add buildings. As Ernie Cortez has long noted with regard to the issue of power, there are only two ways to build power, organized money and organized people. This is a crucial issue for our nation, given the outsized role, given the outsized role of financial contributions in our political system. And this problem has been with us, as you know, for decades, reinforced by the 2010 court decision, Citizens United. And even though 80% of Americans polled voiced opposition to this ruling, severely limiting the regulation of political contributions, still big money continue, still that ruling is in effect, right? It's, it's very, um, it limits how much political contributions can be regulated. And big money continues pouring into campaign coffers. Big donors even have made their peace with the mobs that attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th and that have metastasized into an ongoing threat on the electoral process itself. For its part, COPS and its parent group, the Industrial Areas Foundation, have long sought, have long sought out alliances with counterweights to corporate power, such as labor unions, PTAs, and religious congregations. And yet, and yet, Ernesto Cortez has learned not to demonize corporate players, but rather to treat them as equals across the table. This approach reflects hard-headed realism, of course, but even more, it stems from his belief that we are all called to love one another. Cortez, puts it th Cortez put it this way in a television interview, love implies relationship. It requires reciprocity. If you're not reciprocal, if you're not mutual, you lose a dimension of your humanity. Evoking the venerable principle of mutual aid, he asks, how do we begin to connect with other human beings and create that solidarity, that mutuality that makes us human? But he had this interview decades ago. Today, when our crises and divisions are so much worse, is that even possible, the stuff he's talking about? We certainly will not be saved by starry-eyed optimism. Actually, Ernie, Ernie Cortez would agree, but he would remind us that we also will not be saved by clever cynicism. As we face challenges seemingly unprecedented in their magnitude, the mutual aid vision bids us respond with a bravery rooted in love, despite everything and because everything is at stake. Oh, thank you, Dr. Paisior. You know, you really connected the dots between some of our previous Macri talks and and not only what came before, what we have been hearing about in some of those Macri talks, but also what was going on simultaneous to the emergence of organizations like LULAC and, and that sort of thing. So thank you. That was really, um, really informative. We have a couple of good questions I want to get in um, before our hour is up. And the first question is about 
the Catholic Church. Um, was the Catholic Church at all involved in these mutual aid societies? Yes, yes, it was. Um, most of them were not. Uh, most of the mutual aid societies were not religious, and a number of them um, for bad discussion of religion or politics, and by politics they meant Mexican politics, because they knew that people get all heated and it could hurt, it could split up the organization and destroy it. Having said that, there were a number of Catholic mutual aid societies, starting with the very beginning. One of the first female ones was in San Francisco in the 1850s of women in a parish up there banding together as uh, to pray and to help each other with uh, burials and so forth. And then going on in um, South Texas, for example, there was like a network of Catholic mutualista groups. Also, when the mutualista movement faded away for all the reasons I gave, the Catholic ones were more likely to perdure, pur perdure as Ernie Cortez would call it using the Spanish cognate, um, probably because they had the infrastructure support of the parishes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, also, um, yeah, so. Okay, okay. Um, we do have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Sonia Hernandez, um, who she writes, Dr. Paisior, um, Always a pleasure learning from you. Thank you for doing this work. These groups like the Agrupacion Protectora and Alianza and others are so crucial to our understanding of civil rights and women's history and women's key role in providing the often emotionally taxing work of planning funeral activities so central to Mexican and Mexican-American life. Also interesting to see how often class lines could be blurred in some of these mutual aid groups when unifying to combat violence. And so now here's a question. Do you know of any um, mutual aid or collective organization that was in that involved African American, Mexican American, and Anglo American women focused on passing an anti lynching bill? Wow. I don't know about that. I, I, I it, by, by your question, it's, um, Dr. Hernandez, it sounds like there you have a little bit of evidence. I hope so. Uh, no, I, I, I don't know about that. I was thinking someone like Teresa Paloma Costa might know, but I, I, no, I, yeah. I don't know. Although I do have a piece in the book about um, grassroots anti-lynching uh, barrio organizing. Uh, that very much included women, but it wasn't across racial lines. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Luisa Gonzalez. Everybody wants to know, is there more information about her? I mean, I know we know she was a midwife and, I, and midwives had some pretty important standing in the community at this time. We know she was the president of the San Antonio Alianza, but like, is there a picture of her? Is there anything else we can know about her? I wish the way I know about her is she was only she was mentioned in one of the newspaper articles, and that's another thing I talk about. I have a whole chapter on the media, um, a whole well more than one chapter on the media, a whole section on the media, and how, the importance of the barrio. Um, um, newspapers, and they covered all these things. It was so great. And they talked about this chapter, the activities of this chapter of the AHA with the president being this woman. And um, that's the only way I knew who she was. And so then I took the year of that issue and looked at the San Antonio City Directory and she was listed in there as a midwife. And yes. that's the only way I know it's pretty sketchy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not surprising that she was a midwife, given that, um, again, this the sort of social importance of midwives in the community at the time and the, the fact that the mutual aid societies, um, part of what they were doing was addressing people's health needs. But that's too that's bad. That's a good insight. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Um, I and and then maybe just one last thing about you since you mentioned media and and earlier in the presentation, you talked about the uh, concerns that people had about the way Mae Gunnels were being represented in Hollywood films um, and presented in a negative light. Um, 
I just I think that's so interesting because you um, you kept mentioning how mutual aid societies in the past are very clearly connected to things that are happening right now uh, or or these these threads of continuing need and yet uh, what we find right now is that Latinos including Mexican Americans are so underrepresented in uh, Hollywood in in productions cultural productions like that. Unless um, it's, you know, the gang member, the, the drug dealer, the modern um, bandido, right? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. I think of, I mean, I'm, I'm so old. I, I'm thinking, I think, of, for example, Nancy de los Santos, who was starting to do stuff on this 40 years ago, I think. Um, it's mm -hmm. gotten better, but it's still, and of course, we've had great people like her and Hector Galan and, 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 and people, mm -hmm. but, but. In terms of the, as you imply, the Hollywood establishment, it, it's 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 really hard. If we could only get to there, it seems like we've made more um, strides as women. They seem to finally get it in terms a little bit in terms of women. They're women producers, but if we could just get there, yeah, we yeah. Well, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. And of course, I want to thank our audience for joining us. And I also want to thank AARP for sponsoring tonight's talk. I hope you can join us again. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll be, um, we're will be we co-sponsoring an event with Yale University, a panel on trans Latinx studies with Francisco Galarte, uh, Linda Heidenreich, and Lawrence LaFontaine Stokes. It's going to be at 3 o'clock Central four o'clock Eastern, and it's going to be presented on Zoom, and you can find more information about it on our Facebook page, Twitter, and our website. And then also, um, after that, we will be bringing some of the folks from the Refusing to Forget project on November the 15th for a um, to hear about the new book that they have. They have a new anthology out called okay. Reverberations of Racial Violence. Uh, so I hope you can join us then. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful night. Good night. Thank you, everybody.